truly shocking. Forest fire is a military weapon. Final report, June 1970. Yet more insanity from the military-industrial complex. This formerly classified U.S. military report provides in-depth detail on the methods the military uses to prepare vast swaths of forests for extremely intense wildfire incinerations. The United States Forest Service provided much of the data for the U.S. military. Question, is that really the job description for the Forest Service to instruct the U.S. military on how to, quote, set the stage for maximum intensity wildfire incinerations by months-long atmospheric spraying of desiccants and defoliants? Are U.S. citizens and populations around the world now in the same category as the Viet Cong were during the U.S. invasion of Vietnam? Geoengineeringwatch.org has desperately tried to sound the alarm on this exact scenario for a decade and a half. Even more disturbing about this report is the fact that it includes specific data that outlines the best engineered wildfire incineration timing for various regions in the U.S. and other nations that are thought to be U.S. allies. One of the regions in the U.S. that is specifically covered in this report is Mount Shasta, California, my backyard. Top fire agency officials have repeatedly acknowledged the now unprecedented behavior of wildfires. Every year is worse than the last. Why? All official sources refuse to or are unable to offer any valid explanation for the increasingly catastrophic fires and fire behavior. Why not? Every single person that I've talked to so far has made the mention that I don't know why it's doing what it's doing. It's burning differently. It's burning uh, more aggressive um, than, than it has in years past. And I know we say that every year, but it, it's, it's unprecedented. It's burning in every direction all at the same time. Other cities and regions that are rated for their incineration potential in this report include Washington, D.C., Florida, New Mexico, New York, South Carolina, Texas, Utah, Minnesota, and in the formerly golden state of California, Los Angeles, Mount Wilson, Blue Canyon, and, as mentioned a moment ago, in my neck of the woods, Mount Shasta, California. Other countries rated for their incineration potential include Greece, Turkey, France, Spain, all of which are countries that have recently been hit with catastrophic wildfires. Just a coincidence? You decide. The United States military machine has always treated the environment with unimaginable contempt. What's business as usual for the military-industrial complex? Blowing up pristine tropical islands to test nuclear bombs, detonating nuclear bombs in the atmosphere, on civilian cities, using radioactive depleted uranium munitions all over the Middle East, in the Balkans, toxic water supplies on military bases for our own troops to consume, highly toxic burn pits next to military bases which contaminated countless military personnel and civilian populations. The list goes on and on and on. For the record, the U.S. military is the largest single source polluter on the planet. Not an opinion, a statistical fact. Would the U.S. military use weather as a weapon? Short answer, yes. But would the U.S. military participate in the toxic spraying of forest lands in our own country in order to set the stage for extreme wildfire incinerations? Why would they, many ask? Let's start with this. The U.S. military has for decades stated on the record that the rapidly heating climate poses the greatest U.S. national security threat of all. Now consider this puzzle piece. Are U.S. military climate intervention operations being used to facilitate catastrophic forest incinerations in the insane attempt to provide temporary and highly toxic surface cooling? by attempting to mimic the temporary cooling effect of large volcanic eruptions, which the latest science data confirms can only destroy what's left of the climate system. The excess atmospheric particles actually trap more overall heat than they deflect, along with completely derailing the hydrological cycle and destroying the ozone layer, all of which rapidly worsens the overall heating of our dying planet. In fact, this exact scenario is the primary stated goal of so-called solar radiation management operations, blocking out the sun with jet aircraft sprayed atmospheric particles to provide temporary, again, though highly toxic, surface cooldowns on planet Earth at the cost of an even worse overall warming. The military-industrial complex has long since considered utilizing nuclear bombs to fill the atmosphere with particles that provide temporary and toxic cooling. 
any that believe the same controllers wouldn't utilize extreme forest fires to accomplish the same objective need to think again. From the perspective of the climate engineers, filling the atmosphere with wildfire smoke does, in fact, accomplish the same objective. Connect the puzzle pieces while I cover some excerpts from this extensive, formerly classified U.S. military report, again titled, Forest Fire as a Military Weapon. In 1965, the Joint Chiefs of Staff requested that the Secretary of Defense initiate research to determine the feasibility of measuring the flammability characteristics of forests and jungle growth, modifying flammability so that vegetation would readily support combustion and developing measures to destroy large areas of forest by fire. Forest flammability can be greatly increased by killing all shrub vegetation, selecting optimal weather conditions for burning and igniting fires in pre-selected patterns. Page 3. The program was concerned with basic flammability problems of the major vegetation types of the world, i.e., they wanted to know how to incinerate any forest anywhere at any time. Page 6. The effect of heat kill on opening up the forest canopy for aerial observation is practically identical to that achieved by spraying the forest with defoliant chemicals. The leaves fall off given time, but the twigs and limbs remain. Page 8. Under exceptional circumstances, forest fires may develop into the phenomenon known as a firestorm. This combination results in the development of strong surface winds which act to fan the fire and increase its burning rate. The increased burn rate causes more rapid air entrainment with a consequent further increase in wind speed, which increases burning rate still faster, which increases etc., etc., until all available fuel has been burned. Wind velocities exceeding 100 miles an hour are often attained during peak firestorm development. Firestorms have now all too often become the norm. I wonder why. Again, achieving such conditions is the actual objective of these military operations. Page 11. A technique for successful forest burning must involve feasible procedures for developing adequate fuels, for bringing the fuels to proper moisture content, and for burning under satisfactory weather conditions. To serve as fuel, all living vegetation on the ground level must be killed by a desiccation treatment. The moisture content of this material must be reduced to a low level, i.e. to a point where the heat produced by combustion and transferred to new fuels will exceed the heat absorbed by water remaining in the fuel. Question, is it just an amazing coincidence that forest fuel moistures are now commonly at record low levels in countless regions all over the world that are incinerating from wildfires of record intensity? Page 13, since all forest fires must be started as ground fires, 25% moisture in ground litter is an absolute upper limit for incendiary operations of military value. Page 20. In most situations, burning of shrub types is not successful unless the amount of dead material has been increased by killing and desiccating the plants. Again, for the record, climate engineering elements are desiccants, starting with aluminum, which also kills soils, root systems, and thus forests. Page 22. When the litter and underbrush have dried sufficiently to burn well, which usually takes at least six to eight weeks of drought, All conifers will crown easily and burn extremely hot. Because of their heavier fuel weights, firestorms are more common in conifers other than pine than any other fuel type. Page 26. The achievement of a crown fire or a firestorm in any hardwood forest requires external measures which will lower the moisture content of the crown foliage and branches and or increase the amount of dead surface fuels that can transfer heat into the tree crowns. Translation, much preparation and planning is needed to produce extremely hot crown fires, a.k.a. firestorms. Total insanity. The weather makers control the spigot, drought, or deluge at their discretion. Page 40, vertical distribution. Given an adequate amount of available fuel, the vertical distribution of particles has the greatest influence on fire spread through a fuel bed. Page 49, whenever possible, incendiary operations should be limited to days when cloud cover is three-eighths or less. Page 50, the planner should look for stable periods of clear, dry weather, and these are usually associated with high pressures and light surface winds. Think 
ionosphere, heater-induced high-pressure heat domes. Think HARP in Alaska and other facilities like it all over the world. Page 52, desiccation techniques. The desiccation process, converting live green vegetation into dead, dry fuel, benefits burning in several ways. The desiccation process is especially slow. If the stems remain attached to a living root system, the entire process requiring 6 to 12 months. This report statement makes clear forests are put through a, quote, process that may take a year or more before the engineered incineration is commenced. Page 54, stem treatment. This method involves killing larger trees for burning by injecting herbicide into the stem or by girdling the stem. Additional treatment of understory vegetation is needed to prepare a forest for burning. The purpose of stem treatment is to kill both the tree trunk and crown and allow adequate time for drying ahead of burning. This method will add fuel on the ground eventually after tree chops have broken off or entire trees have fallen. This requires one or two years in drier climates. For a decade and a half, geoengineeringwatch.org has warned that the climate engineering atmospheric spraying was setting the stage for unprecedented wildfires. In dense forests, the primary problem is that aerial sprays are trapped in the upper tree crowns and never reach the ground. Spray effectiveness remains about the same over a range of low canopy densities, but drops sharply under higher canopy densities. Page 56. Desiccants suitable for aerial application are of two kinds. Systemic herbicides which enter the plant, move through the vascular system, and kill tissue away from the point of contact. Two, contact herbicides which kill only the living tissue that is directly contacted. Leaves remain attached for months on evergreen vegetation under climates with long dry seasons. Sound familiar? After specific fall rains, geoengineeringwatch.org has monitored dead, dry leaves hanging on deciduous trees, often for months. This is not nature. It is exactly what this forest fires as a weapon report outlines. Page 65. In addition to treating live vegetation with desiccant chemicals and timing incendiary operations to take every possible advantage of the weather, forest fires can be made to spread more rapidly and burn more intensely by igniting many small fires in a predetermined pattern. Page 67, how can we achieve the maximum burning rate over any given area? Or, to put it another way, how can we get the maximum amount of fuel burning at one time? Page 71, incendiary devices. The proper spacing of incendiary sets is much more critical to the success of forest burning operations than is the type of device used to produce ignition. Ignition of forest litter is most readily accomplished by small cluster-type incendiary weapons designed for direct flame contact with the fuel. Page 73. Chemical defoliation of overstory trees and shrubs is the only logistically feasible method of augmenting the surface fuel supply. Defoliation missions should be flown at least four months in advance of the incendiary missions. Weather is crucial for success in forest burning. Incendiary operations must be preceded by at least a week of dry weather, and cloud cover should be three-eighths or less with relative humidity below 50% in the target area at the time of ignition. Maximum fire intensity is achieved by spacing ignitions so that adjacent fires begin to interact with each other at the exact time that each fire has reached its maximum normal intensity. Proper use of this area of ignition technique can greatly increase the effectiveness of forest fire as a military weapon. All of this has been and is occurring, not just in some far-off land, which is horrifying enough, but also in our own country. The U.S. military document covered in this report, which includes references to numerous potential target regions within the U.S., is beyond shocking and alarming. For over a decade and a half, geoengineeringwatch.org has monitored and reported on the constant climate engineering assault on our forests, on us, and everything else in the web of life. An assault that has been ongoing for over 75 years, but which continues to be officially denied, not just by official sources, but by a so far willfully blind public, in spite of the fact that climate engineering operations are shockingly visible in our skies, with the consequences of the climate intervention operations already being far past catastrophic. Climate engineering is weather warfare. What we collectively face is a fight for life, nothing less. We can debate 
on the agendas and objectives of the global controllers, but the fact that climate engineering operations are being used to completely disrupt historical climate and weather patterns, causing unprecedented drought and wildfires in many regions, while others are drowned in biblical-scale deluge, is beyond dispute. Satellite images conclusively confirm the almost inconceivably massive geoengineering operations being conducted all over the world. Extremely extensive science data and testing analysis further confirms the weather warfare reality. Climate engineering desiccant particles, which are also incendiary materials, are absolutely present in our air column in staggeringly toxic amounts. Nanoparticle elements of aluminum, barium, strontium, manganese, polymers, and even graphene. Further consequences of climate intervention operations include the total decimation of the ozone layer, which is by itself an extremely near-term existential threat. What will it take for the truth to be acknowledged by the so-called science community, official sources, and the public? Will the moment of recognition be when we hit the wall of total planetary life support system collapse? Those in power are not gods, and we are not helpless. All of us are needed in this desperate battle to defend what is yet left of the planet's life support systems, on which all of our lives and our children's completely depend. The first and most critical leap in the right direction that we can make is to achieve a critical mass of awareness in the population, not just an awareness of bad things happening or that governments and militaries are criminally corrupt, but an awareness of the fact that what we face is a right here, right now fight for life. A malignant cancer of the criminally insane is completely in control. They must be exposed and brought to justice, legally and morally, or very soon there will be nothing left to salvage. Sharing credible data from a credible source is key. Geoengineeringwatch.org will continue to strive to be such a source. Check the activist suggestions link on the homepage of geoengineeringwatch.org to get specific details on how you can help to move this fight forward. Sharing the link for the groundbreaking climate engineering documentary titled The Dimming is Essential. We, all of us, each of us, must make every day count in this most critical effort to turn the tide. Please, make your voice heard while it can still make a difference. This is Dane Wigington with geoengineeringwatch.org.